In this video, the ins and outs of the buttonless button box. If you're into the technical details of how this project worked, stick around. <clears throat> if you haven't seen it already, definitely check out this project. The video released not so long ago, where we have a buttonless button box and we've just got little cards where we print off our logo, well, buttons and what they do, and we insert them into this box that lights up. And we push the buttons and it just works like a regular button but it's got no got no buttons it uses infrared sensors instead so the whole idea behind this was i saw a video of a guy who used like a string deck or something and put it into his button box they're really expensive like a couple of hundred dollars to use one of those and i thought this would be exactly the same but at a fraction of the cost that's why we went with it Ironically, around the same time, I saw another video of an old style computer which had touch screen and capacitive touch would have been around when that video was made. Well, when the video probably was, but when that machine was, it certainly wasn't. And it used sensors around the edges, and I thought I could do the same with infrared sensors, right? So that's what we went with. So in each of these edges, we can't really see this. There's a um, infrared sensor on one side to detect the infrared beam being emitted from the other side. So let's have a look at the design. So here's our design, it's made up of uh, about four or five different pieces. We've got the dial on top which goes onto the encoder where we can choose our colours or whatever. The front face and it's got the holes in it here so in, within one of these holes it's either an emitter or, or receiver of the uh, infrared signal and it works in a button matrix i made another video about this previously so check it out i was going to use capacitive touch with the csp32 but it's never going to work it's never sensitive enough or well, wasn't for the method i used anyway uh, then it's got a base which has the um <coughs> which is just the height of the leds or near pixels so they can shine up and give us the button color and the gap between the bottom of here and the top of here when it's assembled it's just wide enough to fit through a piece of paper for our buttons to work. On the bottom we've just got a little holder which holds onto the SPC32 and the multiplexer, we'll go over there a little bit later, and of course the back case which has got a slot for the card to go in and a slot for the power cable to go into the ESP32. Originally with this project I was just soldering the diodes directly onto a um, prototype board on the bottom but the prototype boards are quite narrow and it sort of restricted the amount of space we had so to widen the button so you could actually get your finger in there I moved these sensors onto a, their own individual PCBs you can pull them in and out and it's a lot better sort of solution and on the bottom is the um, near pixels and they go sort of in a snake pattern up the um, up the board so we can individually address each one depending on which button we want to push on. When you push the button in it goes a little bit light, brighter to indicate that it's on and if you're on toggle mode you push it in and the light stays on when you push it again it goes off so you know whether it's on or off. So as I suggested earlier we're using an ESP32 to do all the heavy lifting for this project um, but we had a couple of um, bumps in the road when trying to use that. So ESP32 is a great little device, it's got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and lots of I.O. pins but uh, what we didn't really realise was that some of those things stop working when you start using the Wi-Fi or the Bluetooth. So we see the pin out here for the ESP32 and we see it's got truckloads of uh, these orange ones are the analog inputs so what's going to happen is for the infrared sensors it's not like a switch, it decides whether it's being, being broken or not it's got an analog output and that value goes up or down depending on how much infrared light it's being transmit, transmitted through so it's not a switch at all it's just sort of variable so we need to measure it with an analog um, pin and on this device it has truckloads of analog pins but when we turn the bluetooth on half of them turn off and on the, the one I've got uh, some of the other pins, analog pins don't work either so you know with like six analog pins which is three by three matrix which is nine buttons kind of pointless really 
so what I had to do to um, get around that problem was use a multiplexer. And what a multiplexer lets us do is use half as many pins but measure a lot more uh, inputs. So confusing. So here is sort of a multiplexer. This is the actual one I used. And uh, on the side here it's kind of got a bit of a diagram of how it works. What happens is we've got these, this one's got three um, ways of addressing these pins. This one is the one I've used, has four. But essentially, depending on how these are turned on, it'll activate each individual switch and then this one output will measure the analog signal. So, it's, so it'll, it'll be, one of these will be high and this switch will be down and that'll be available to be read by the analog pin and it'll each go through each one rapidly <clears throat> and you'll think well it's slow but it's actually going through so fast it's sort of indistinguishable whether it's which pin it's reading or not because it's flicking through these really quick each individual one and it's only using one analog pin to measure the actual voltage of that particular diode so the big picture is we've got four digital outputs with one analog input controlling 16 individual pins. So I'm going to have 16 diodes connected up to this but I only need four, five down one side, four across the top but I need another three because of the um, card reading thing. So I've got the cards with the extra holes so wherever the holes are is an address so you can have multiple layouts available to read the um, for different layouts and those extra three diodes go through and measure determine which card that is so we've still got another four uh, spare multiplexes we can use so we've still got another four multi extra multiplexes inputs we can use so we can have another four rows of buttons if we wanted to but I think 20 is sort of ample right so I wanted this to be Bluetooth because I was thinking about using a battery to power it all but um, at the end of the day there's 70 individual LEDs just about in this project so you'd still need to power it unless you've got a massive battery power back but it still <coughs> can be plugged into your PC easy enough but it is using Bluetooth to communicate rather than the serial because if you go back to my other videos you'll know you need a particular type of controller to talk properly it's just ugly so Bluetooth is easier way to go and the software I used, or well, the library I used to do that, was something called ESP32 BLE, BLE Gamepad. And this is sort of a brilliant library. It has all the features you could want. 128 buttons. If we want 128 buttons, we could do so. We've used 20 on this project. Or we have 20 buttons on this project. But if we go back to the um, ESP32, we can see we've used four pins for the uh, multiplexer, one pin for the analog input, one pin for the uh, neopixels because they only need one pin to control all those because the serial and another two pins for the um, encoder which leaves us with over a dozen or so more we can connect any other buttons we want to onto it so we're not limited to just 20 and that's it you can add as many more as you want to on the remaining inputs or outputs or even add another multiplexer and go uh, and go nuts so yep this is the library I use you could use your own of course but uh, this seems to have everything of course being Bluetooth it just connects nicely to the Windows um, interface and Windows Bluetooth or gaming I've used in games it works sort of without any problems uh, at all so normally I release all my projects or put all the 3D files and printables but for this project it is um, it's a bit clunky because I'm using 5 millimeter, 5 millimeter LEDs and there are actually 3 millimeter IR LEDs available so I'm getting some of those in I'm going to sort of redesign this whole thing and probably release that to you guys what I'll do is um, rather than having everything on it I'm just going to have the button box and then it's just going to be like a, a header you can plug your own device into and program it up as you like so it'll be the unit and then no controller or anything and just the um, 
matrix so the duplex the multiplexer pins and the um, encoder and you can just plug it in and program it as you please within your with your Arduino if you want to. Mm. So there's a couple of comments on that video I just wanted to address before um, finishing off this video. Uh, if you want to support the channel just leave a comment. Don't have to spend any money, don't have to do anything. Just if you leave a comment YouTube thinks people are watching it, maybe they are, and uh, we'll point more traffic my way. But uh, let's just quickly go over a couple of things here. Simply brilliant. Oh, simply brilliant. Yep, I know, right? And the punch card is. I think will be useful. You can use nine different cards, nine different games. Uh, pretty cool. You consider directly printing connections instead of wiring. The problem with those copper filaments is they've got high resistance, and um, it's not quite there yet. And my industry V2 is monocolor. I can only print one color. So until they get something sorted with that copper filament, it's not really sort of a practical solution at the moment. It's more trouble than it's worth, I think. You making cool things, very thank you. Great idea, but I don't feel the button feedback. No clicky sound. So I've got probably I could probably add a speaker and a sort of a cell phone motor, but you're not gonna have that clicky feel. Which is fine because with the extra inputs and outputs available on the SP32, you can add those extra buttons right paper is too fragile I think I wonder if you can use acrylic I was going to use acrylic but then it will make the whole thing thicker again and the button will activate before you even touch the paper and if it's laminated you need to kind of put your finger through it right so I don't think it's a problem be human and use your own voice my top complaint I get all the time the comments is I hate your voice pretty much so I was using AI voice on that video and it's way easier for me to use that as well because if I need to do recording it and shared, it's, it's only a short amount of time I can do things, which is why my videos are so far apart perhaps. But let me know if you hated that one or not, or you didn't even know any, notice any difference. Um, but for me, using AI voice, <clears throat> I don't think this video is any better or any worse than, than previously, so sort of juries out whether that's um, a good thing or not. Okay, so coming up to the next uh, video, we'll be doing analog gauges, so analog speedo and tachometer, uh, using motors that we actually use in um, real cars. So stick around for that one. Uh, we'll probably do, do boost pressure as well as um, maybe oil temperature or something like that. Uh, of course, I'm using SimHub, so you could easily go down to your local car parts store or whatever and get a rev counter, hook that up, and it'll work. But those rev counters, well, I'll see anyway, don't go to um, 12,000, 13,000 RPM or 400 kilometers. So we're going to hook up these dials so they go all the way to 12 or 13,000 in 300 Ks or whatever. Uh, so it should be pretty cool. Um, as well as the oil pressure and boost pressure. All in analog format, so it's kind of awesome. Uh, aside from that, thanks for watching.